Shoku Tensei is extremely controversial. This is a show with a scumbag main character who everybody seems to hate. A show that can be very morally questionable at times with some really uncomfortable scenes to watch, and most terribly of all, it's an isekai. Thanks to these unforgivable crimes, people would argue about it everywhere, talking about how disgusting it is. So going in, I was already fully aware that all of this stuff was gonna happen, but it still surprised me. How? Because despite all the gross fan service, despite its problematic main character, despite all the controversies and all the other things I mentioned beforehand, it's actually kind of sweet. But before that, I have a story to tell. You see, while making this video, I had a huge problem. Mishoku Tensei was blocked on Netflix Australia and I couldn't even watch it. I was stuck, I didn't know what to do. But then something amazing happened. Atlas VPN, the sponsor of today's video, reached out and saved me. Thanks to them, I could just bypass the geo restrictions by just choosing to watch it from a different country. Now I can watch Mishogo Tensei in all its glory with enhanced internet speeds and on unlimited devices too. And you can do the same, gaining access to tons of shows that aren't available in your country. Going to a completely safe and not suspicious website to satisfy your anime needs? Atlas VPN has got your back with its built-in ad blocker and malware protection, even notifying you when someone Someone's trying to steal your data. It really is quite convenient. But that's not all. What? Subscription services can be pretty expensive, especially if you have several. But with Atlas VPN, you can switch to a different country with different prices and get massive discounts while shopping online. And all you need to do is click the link in the description. They're running a huge discount right now where you can get a free year subscription for just $1.99 a month. And hey, if it isn't for you, you can get a 30 day money back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Go get your deal now by clicking the link in the description below. Now onto the video. Shoku Tensei is actually kind of sweet. I mean it. Going into the show, I was not expecting there to be as many heartwarming moments as there were. Moments that were just really nice and made me smile. Moments that were emotional. Moments that I could comfortably watch in front of my parents and they wouldn't think I'm a disappointment. The show felt surprisingly grounded for an isekai and I actually felt like this was a living, breathing world that almost felt real. Like, instead of just copy pasting the same old generic isekai world, this one was manually built from the ground up and had real thought put into it. Watching Rudius learn magic for the first time made me almost feel like a child again with just how exciting and adventurous it all felt. Like, it wasn't just, oh cool, I learned magic. It was, holy crap, I learned magic! And I'm not even gonna talk about the phenomenal soundtrack, and especially the animation, because it just speaks for itself. I mean, look at it! Even just the outlines look so unique, with a slight pencil sketchiness to its texture. They even added film grain and a slight jitter to the frames to make it look like it was shot in film, and it just looked so good! And most importantly, it really felt like it had real substance to its characters and story. I'll get more into that later, but when I watched this, it almost felt like I was watching an isekai for the first time. The wonder, the excitement, the new friendships, the adventure, and of course, how human all the characters felt. It all combined together to create something that, in my opinion, is quite beautiful. But Brandon, what about all that nasty stuff in it? How could it possibly have any level of sweetness and substance to it when it has such a high level of degeneracy? And that, my dear viewer, is a very good question that I'm not gonna answer. See, I don't like talking about controversial stuff on my channel. So instead, I'm gonna get someone else to do it! <laughs> Let's see, who can be my next victim? Ah. Yes. Anyway! Hey bro, what's up? I need you to talk about what I think is very really important. What? Just do it. Uh, <laughs> Rudy is a pedo. The anime fan service minors. Bro, stop. Trust me, I'm well aware of what the anime did. I watched it multiple times. And I 100% agree with you guys. I hate Rudeus too. Let me repeat that. I hate Rudeus too. I don't blame a single person for feeling uncomfortable watching these scenes. I know because I was disgusted too. I would actually be more worried if people weren't disgusted watching these scenes to be honest. But if you think that Rudy being a perv ruins Mushoku Tensei, or that it affects how well written his character is, that's where you're mistaken my friend. You see, I've done multiple videos on Mushoku Tensei, I've analyzed the anime to death. You could basically say I have a PhD in Mushoku Tensei. And after all this research, I've concluded that Mushoku Tensei just won't be Mushoku Tensei without Rudy being the way he is. The perviness is an integral characteristic of Rudy and plays a huge role in what makes him a well-written character in the first place. And I'm about to say something really mad here, but I really think that if you removed all the controversial scenes from Mushoku Tensei, it would make the show worse because you'd be removing what made it so meaningful. Mushoku Tensei is not your typical isekai, following a morally perfect protagonist. It's a series that follows the journey of an extremely flawed human being. A journey of someone who was given a second chance to take his miserable life from a negative to a positive one. And if that's the main point of the story, then it's important to show him doing the bad things too. 
Instead of brushing aside his past like many other isekai, Mushoku Tensei embraces it, and it has a very real effect on who Rudius is and how he behaves. Rudius' journey of redemption won't be easy. It will be filled with backsides, controversies and hardships because Rudius isn't perfect. But if we've learned anything from season 1, it's that no matter how screwed up Rudy might have been in his past life, he genuinely wants to change, and his story is only just beginning. He may not be able to become a completely different man overnight, but I do know that when it does happen, it's going to be very satisfying and maybe even beautiful. Wow, that was actually really good. Thanks. Oh, by the way, why did you make me do this in the first place? Hello? Uh, anyways, thank you so much for your help, and I'll hey, talk to you next time. See ya! But to be completely honest with you, aside from the obviously bad scenes that were intentionally meant to be uncomfortable, I actually found a lot of the other fanservice elements in Mashoku Tensei to not be all that bad in the first place. And that's because... It's actually pretty funny. I loved a lot of Mashoku Tensei, and I'm not just talking about the fan service anymore, I'm talking about the entire show in general. Usually, I don't like fan service in mainstream anime, especially when it interrupts serious or emotional moments, and that's because a lot of the time, it feels like they're just relying on overused tropes that we've all seen a million times before, and the comedy is only there as a cheap excuse to show some skin, and it fails because it's not funny. But with Mashoku Tensei, it feels right at home. The writer somehow managed to integrate the dirty jokes into everything in a way that feels natural. In my opinion, none of these jokes felt like they're out of place or an interruption. They're just a consistent part of the show that fits with the tone. In fact, most of it doesn't even show anything bad. It's almost always dialogue or situation based. Like for example, there was a scene where Rudius, being the perv he is, tricks Ghislaine into showing him her backside. But when she does and he looks, it's just rock solid muscle and Rudius is like, holy crap, I'm not even horny anymore, that's seriously impressive. And to top it all off, a random servant walks in to see this glorious sight and it is amazing. At the beginning of one of the episodes, we see Rudius waking up and praying before his holy shrine, and it was just so ridiculously stupid I couldn't help but laugh. And in episode 2, we basically spent the entire episode focused on Rudy's backstory and character development. It was an emotional roller coaster where he finally was able to open up and get over his past trauma, finally being able to go outside. And after years of tutoring, he says goodbye to Roxy in a heartfelt scene, thanking her for everything that she did for him that he'll remember her and will definitely respect her from then on. And then he proceeds to get caught with the same stolen panties immediately after. The end. Now this should have annoyed me, but it didn't. Somehow I felt like this moment worked really well, and I never felt like it took away from the emotion that came beforehand. It's just so typical of Rudius to do this sort of thing, and it made sense. Plus, it was a great way of showing that he has grown, but still has quite a fair bit to go. Most importantly, the focus here is on the joke. There's no borderline nudity or overused tropes here. Anyone can understand what the joke is, and it serves the purpose of being a joke. I know there are probably a lot of you who saw this moment and just rolled your eyes at it, and that's okay since that probably just means you're a functional human being, but for whatever reason, I felt like it just fit and was the best way to end the episode. I, I don't really know why, it was just a vibe I got from it and stuff. I'm doing a terrible job of arguing with Shoku Tensei's week. I'm so sorry. Anyway, I need your help. I'm trying to explain why the jokes are funny, but I'm doing a terrible job at it. Okay, but first, answer my question from before. Why did you get me to do the first part? Uh, so that if the video got backlashed, you would take the blame? Hello? Oh! <laughs> he abandoned me. <laughs> No, 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 you, you know what? Fine, uh, I can do it myself. Who cares what other people think? I think the dirty jokes in Mishoku Tensei are funny and really well done. And while we're at it, I don't think there's anything wrong with Rudius having romantic relationships with kids his age either, because he is a kid. Just because he has memories of his past life, it doesn't make him not a kid anymore. Yeah, of course the sexual harassment is a problem, but there's nothing wrong with just normal romance in itself. It'd be even weirder if he went off to middle-aged adults like, ew, I don't wanna see that. And the fan service, yeah, okay, it was pretty bad, but it was way less frequent than I thought it was gonna be. I was expecting this to be like the next Iro Manga Sensei or something from the way everyone was going about it, but no, it would go several episodes where nothing bad would happen, and when it did happen, it would get it over with quickly. And it was done in a tactful way, where instead of unironically sexualizing minors for the heck of it, the focus was on how creepy Rudius was being, which is how it should be. Everything else was just jokes, which again, were actually funny. So there, that's my opinion on the subject, I'm roast meat. Moving on though, there are also plenty of jokes that aren't fan servicey at all. One of my favorite running jokes is whenever Rudius gets locked up somewhere, and in the next episode he proceeds to sarcastically talk about how wonderful his new home is. Look, it even has security! How thoughtful of them. And then Geese, best side character ever by the way, is introduced, and the first thing he sees is this, and he's just like, 
Well, this is my new leader now. There is so much great dialogue and interactions between these characters throughout the entire show, I couldn't list it all. Like, it's not anything that had me dying of laughter or anything, but it had me smiling a lot. Like, Paul isn't a great father, especially at the beginning, but even a lot of scenes with him and Rudy as just talking to each other were really enjoyable. And while it was obviously weird for Paul to be talking about girls in this way to his eight-year-old child, like, Paul, what are you doing? There was something strangely heartwarming about Paul taking the time to talk to and bond with Rudius. Because while he is a womanizer and a scumbag, he really is trying to be a better dad and a better person. But I'm not going to go into depth in that just yet since I have an entire section dedicated to Paul and I'll talk about it then. But to sum up this section, Mashoku Tensei is like a walking contradiction. It makes the most unwholesome things wholesome, immediately makes it unwholesome again, but the wholesome part still remains and now I feel guilty for liking it. Which leads me to part 3. It shouldn't work, but it somehow does. I think this statement sums up my personal experience with Mashoku Tensei very well. I have very little interest in most isekais, and Mashoku Tensei does practically nothing to differentiate itself because it was basically the first one. It is textbook isekai through and through. Otaku loser dies and goes to another world and is now extremely good looking, intelligent, and skilled with magic, and he has multiple love interests. And the thing about this is, I don't like harems in serious stories. It feels scummy and unfaithful to me. Yeah, I know I may sound like a grouchy old man, but I feel like whenever a character has a harem, it's like he's somehow cheating on all of them at once. I have felt this way on so many other harems, even the ones that aren't technically harems, because every time they just feel icky. I just want one good love interest character. I don't need more. But for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but somehow with Mashoku Tensei, this time it worked. This is the first time I actually found myself equally as invested in each of these relationships, and hoping all of them would somehow be with Rudius in the end. Like, it's the only inevitable outcome the story could go. I just want them all to be happy in the end, that's not too much to ask. A possible reason for this is that it carefully develops each of these relationships separately in a way where they don't interfere with each other. They're all just as well done as the other, and it's done very naturally as well. And it helps that it's set in a time period where having multiple wives would be considered socially acceptable. I think. But that's mostly just speculation. Aside from that, I honestly don't have a clue how the writer managed to make this work for me. I am glad though, because that meant that it didn't hinder my enjoyment of the show like it usually would. But the biggest thing in my opinion that shouldn't work in Mashoku Tensei but somehow does, is the entire plot in itself. Or more specifically, the way it goes about it. You see, it actually does something that I don't really see a lot in most other anime. The standard type of plot would just go, okay, here's what your goal is, we're gonna spend the rest of the anime trying to achieve said goal, and once we do, we're done. Bada bing, bada boom. I'm obviously oversimplifying things here, but you get the point. Mashoku Tensei, however, starts off with nothing at first, and we just kind of explore and learn more about the world, which is standard isekai stuff so far. Rudy then slowly develops small and personal goals. They aren't huge ones that define the entire story, just simple stuff that kind of acts as a backdrop to the characters, the things that happen to them, and the world building. In the beginning, it follows a pretty standard story structure. Rudy wants to go to magic school with Sylphie, so in order to do that, he needs to go to Cool Castle Place and teach magic to Spoiled Brat, which leads them to facing their own problems while doing that, and so on. One goal leads to the next thing, and in order to do that, he needs to do the next thing. For the first eight episodes of Mashoku Tensei, it basically works like this, which is still very similar to the standard isekai formula, and it worked really well. But here's where I made a mistake. Since I enjoyed these first few episodes the way they were, I was also under the assumption that the entirety of the show was going to be like this. So when in one episode this suddenly happened and teleported them to Nowhere Land, instead of being all shocked and surprised like everyone else was, me, being stupid, thought it was a side story. Dude, you're telling me we're meant to spend all this time to walk all the way back to the royal palace just to continue Eris' draining and go to magic school? Just so we can introduce this guy? Oh, what a waste of time! I can't wait until they hurry up and get back so the real story can continue. <laughs> I didn't just think this at the start. Now, that would have been reasonable. But instead, it took eight full episodes with a seasonal break in the middle with me completely ignoring all the hints to reach the point where we see Paul again. And it was only then when I finally realized... Oh... We aren't going back to the way things were, are we? My oblivious stupidity aside, however, what Mashoku Tensei did here was actually very interesting to me. I realized that this scene was the turning point that completely changed the entire show. Everything that was happening up until this point was just a prologue to introduce the characters and give us a chance to get to know them. The entire thing with Rudy going to the academy and all that doesn't really matter anymore at this point. It was only ever a background detail to motivate everything that was happening at the time. It's not the main plot. But going back to the minor disaster, the interesting thing about it is that it doesn't just change the situation the characters are in. 
This moment is so huge that it completely changes the way the entire plot works from now on. After the disaster happens, we're pretty much seeing everything through Rudy's perspective. At first, we're just as confused as he is in regards to what just happened, and we feel like we've lost progress at first. But as the story progresses, it becomes more and more interesting. We slowly start to piece together more and more what just happened, and when we finally get to the point where we meet Paul again, everything clicks. And just like Rudius, we suddenly realize the gravity behind the situation and realize exactly what was going on with the rest of the characters. Things have changed permanently and everything we've done up until this point suddenly becomes relevant to the bigger picture. And now that we have this information, we have a totally new direction for the story to go and we begin the cycle all over again. And Mashoku Tensei uses this structure repeatedly from this point onwards. Something interrupts what was happening before and we feel like it's an annoying setback at first, but then things start to get more interesting and the plot develops. And in the end, it all ties together with everything that was happening beforehand and we now have a new direction to go. Which is a really unique way of telling stories that I haven't seen that much of. So see, I'm not stupid. I was just experiencing it the way it was supposed to be experienced. I hope. Another thing that Mashoku Tensei does is that everything will be going great. We're making progress on our journey and everything's just peachy and then... Things go from 0 to 100 to say the least. This show gets dark, and not in an edgy way that feels like it's trying to prove how dark it is, but in the sense where it slaps you in the face to bring you back to reality. These scenes are brutal, and can happen so suddenly that it leaves you in shock. This may be a fantasy, but that doesn't mean that it flies off to the land of ridiculousness and wish fulfillment. There are stakes here, and the writer treats these situations as if they're reality. It stays grounded. And it's not just us who are reminded of this when these scenes happen. Rudius is dead center in the middle of it, and he's the one who's impacted by it the most. In the beginning of the first Kura, Rudius is shown consistently treating this world as if it's a video game. He thinks about many of his interactions with other people as if it's a dating sim, like they're NPCs or just an award to win. But as the episodes go by, he starts learning to treat these people like people. He stops thinking about these situations as if it's a game and starts actually putting their feelings into consideration, caring about them like they're his actual friends because that's what they've become. But occasionally he does revert back, going in with the childish mindset that so long as he does what usually works in anime and visual novels that'll all work out. But then it backfires and that childishness is instantly crushed the second he realizes that the consequences here are real. These moments serve as a cool reminder that this isn't a game that terrible things can and will happen completely out of nowhere, and that when people die, they stay dead. In regards to tone, the fight with Orsted felt less like an isekai fight and had more in common with the end scene from Invincible's first episode. This was terrifying, and it really felt like there are beings in this world that are so completely beyond us and Rudius only got a small taste of it. But it's not just the physical fights. In the second last episode, Rudius went straight from his highest point to his lowest in a matter of seconds with the realization that Eris left him, and he spends the majority of the last episode in a depressive state and renumerates over his past. I do think that the more we learned about his previous life and backstory, the more understandable he became. And I honestly believe that if we had already seen all these aspects of how he came to be the way he was at the very beginning, then maybe he wouldn't be as controversial as he is. But then again, it's the internet, so probably not. But I realized something the more we really learned about him, as we saw him be bullied and humiliated to the point where he became a shut-in, not because he was lazy, but because he was genuinely scared, not being able to bring himself to go out there again and face it, slowly pushing away everyone who cared about him because he didn't know how to handle it, eventually succumbing to video game addiction, extreme hentai and pornography, becoming the lowest of the low because he couldn't bring himself to get out of it. I realized that after seeing this, I cared about Rudius. I wanted to see him grow, I wanted to see him succeed and have his fresh start. He may have been reincarnated into a new world, but even then, it didn't act as a reset button for his behavior and trauma. The only way for him to really grow is if he puts in the effort to self-reflect, to truly consider other people's feelings, and to make better decisions. And while the process may be slow, he is doing those things, and I want to see him continue. At the end of season 1, after Eris leaves, he's at his lowest point so far. Everybody he cares about, Eris, Ruijud, Paul, Zenith, Roxy, his entire family, everyone is gone and he has no idea where most of them are. He has nobody. So what does he do? 
he stays inside and does nothing, just like he always used to. The shots show the parallels between himself now and his previous life, showing that he's in the same situation all over again. And now all he can do is ask himself if anything has really changed. The old Rudius would have stayed inside and done nothing for the rest of his life, and that's exactly what he did at the time. Even after his parents died, he didn't even care enough to show up to their funeral, only going outside after being forcibly thrown out, where he died soon after. This Rudius doesn't do those things, however. After a lot of reflection, both on his past and his current behaviour, this time his parents are the very thing that he thinks about, and he remembers how important they are to him. And this is where he makes a decision, that he needs to get up this time, that he needs to find Zenith and reunite his family again, leave behind his past, and take a step forward. And that's pretty cool. But despite all this, this wasn't even what surprised me about Mushoku Tensei the most. Going into the show, I kind of already knew that it was going to have a lot of depth and complexity to it, and pointing out these aspects of it isn't exactly revolutionary. The real surprising part of it for me was how many scenes there were where I'd watch it and I'd go, wow, that was actually really sweet. Yay, we're finally getting to the main point of the video! If I had to name one of the biggest differences between the first core and the second, it's that the second core introduced some of the genuinely nicest and sweetest moments in the show so far. Not that there weren't any in the first, but in the second, it doubled down. These moments, honest to god, are my true favourite parts of Mishoku Tensei. And weirdly enough, the fact that the show has so many dark or questionable moments in it make these scenes feel even nicer in comparison. I already brought up before the scene where we say goodbye to Roxy, but God damn it, it's one of my favorite scenes ever and it just deserves to be mentioned again. Just watching Rudius chase after Roxy and stopping, saying thank you, the music, direction, the emotion, it all elevated this scene to a whole nother level. And most importantly, it's Rudy's first real step with his character development and it's the first time it shows us that he's capable of growing. Roxy gets an entire backstory episode where we learn more about why she left home and she realizes just how much her parents missed her. It was a touching episode and it gave us a deeper understanding of who Roxy really is. Even small scenes like Eris just trying to comfort Rudius when he's sad, not really knowing what she's supposed to say since she's never done it before, but trying her best anyways because she really cares. This episode with Aisha! At the beginning she disliked her big brother because she knew he was a pervert and Rudius had to hide the fact that it was him, but after she spent some time with him and they go through a lot of stuff together, she grows closer to him. And in the end, after they say goodbye and they're leaving, she says, And it's like, she knew the whole time? Like, that is the most adorable thing ever. How do you not smile at that? One thing that I really appreciate about Mushoku Tensei is how much it cares about family. Instead of the story just leaving family behind and forgetting about them like in many other isekai, this time the story is about bringing them back together again. It's ironic that despite this being the grandfather of modern isekai, its values focus on something that's almost the complete opposite. And it's not just Rudius, it's a lot of the other characters too. Instead of ignoring the family, this show embraces it and treats it as something important. Which is why my favourite scene in the entire show is just Paul and Rudius sitting at a table trying to talk to each other. At the beginning, I never would have anticipated that Paul would end up being one of my favourite characters in Mishoku Tensei, but that's exactly what this scene did. And it worked because he is a really flawed and complex and interesting character. In the first episode, we're led to believe that he's somewhat of a noble person, however this image is shattered completely as soon as we learn that Lilia is pregnant, meaning Paul is the only possible father. At this point, his true colours are revealed. He's an absolute scumbag who cheated on Zenith with god knows how many people at this point, can be a very questionable father, and did a lot of other not so family friendly things, but he's still human. He makes a lot of absolutely terrible decisions, but he's never depicted as evil because he isn't. He's still a guy who genuinely cares about his family, and when he makes mistakes, he feels guilty about it afterwards, doing his best to not make the same mistake again. After the manor incident, we never see him again for quite some time, but when we do finally see him again, it's a shock. He looks like a total wreck, and when I saw this, I immediately assumed the worst. That he turned to scum again, falling into a state of drinking and lust, and completely lost himself. But then it pulls a reversal on us, and we realise that that wasn't the situation at all. Everyone has gone missing ever since the incident, and this group is a rescue effort to find those people. We then realise just how much Paul has been through to get here, all while having a daughter to protect. That he's been doing everything he could, all while being scared that everyone he cared about was dead or he'd never be able to find them. That he's barely been holding on this entire time. And when I realised this, 
I respected him. The fact that it was obvious what he could have been, but he didn't go down that road. The fact that he went through everything with the sheer drive to find his family again. The fact that despite all of his mistakes and bad decisions, he never lost sight of what was the most important to him. This made me realize that deep down, Paul really is a good person. When he got angry at Rudius for not thinking of anyone else affected by the disaster, it was irrational and misguided. And Geese confronts him with this, reminding him that Rudius is still a child. But instead of being stubborn and prideful about it, okay he was at first, but after reflecting on it, he realized that what really matters here is that his son is okay. So he cleans himself up and talks to him. Rudius at this point has also started to change. When Paul goes out of his way to see him again to properly apologize, Rudius remembers what he did in the past and also self-reflects, realizing that Paul was doing something that he himself was never able to do. So he greets him again with open arms so they could start again, and when they hug, we get one of the most emotional moments in the entire show. Mashoku Tensei isn't just sweet, it's beautiful. It has so much emotional substance to it and makes me genuinely care about its characters no matter how flawed they may be. It made me laugh, it made me cry, it did so much more than I ever could have expected. It has heart, and sometimes it's actually pretty wholesome too. It only feels like it's just beginning, and if it managed to do all this within the span of just one season, then I can't wait to see what happens next. My name is Brandon Riley, and... Wait... Eroi? Hey bro, sorry about that. My internet randomly cut off and it stopped working, but I'm back now. Wait, so... you didn't abandon me? What? Nah bro, it's cool. The internet is a harsh place and people be getting cancelled everywhere over nothing. So I don't blame you at all and totally understand. I like pineapple on pizza. That's it. I diagnose you with that. Wait, what are you- <laughs> Special thanks to Weavent, Komosane, Konatik, Tobias Schmick, off ASMR, and all the other patrons supporting me on Patreon.